Um, and now um, I have the, the amazing pleasure um, and opportunity to introduce our Summer Summit keynote speaker, Dr. Bashara Shuker. Uh, Dr. Shuker is responsible for overseeing the national vaccination efforts under the Biden-Harris administration. Um, he's been named the White House COVID um, vaccinations coordinator and focuses on coordinating the timely, safe, and equitable delivery of COVID vaccinations to the U.S. population. Modern Healthcare has named him one of the 50 most influential healthcare executives in the U.S. and one of the top 25 innovators in healthcare. Joining us from the White House, Dr. Shukare, it's an honor to have you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. I have uh, enormous appreciation for Scale Health and its mission to spur innovation in global health. So it's really a pleasure being here today. So what I thought I'll do today is I'll um, give folks an update on where we are with the state of the pandemic. I'll touch on um, our progress on the vaccination program. Um, I'll also talk about some of the plans for vaccination efforts moving forward for the summer months, including our continued focus on partnering with primary care docs and health systems in this effort, and on ensuring we're improving vaccine uptake and confidence in an equitable way, which has been um, a focus of our efforts from the start. Um, I'll also touch briefly on misinformation and the Surgeon General's advisory, uh, which I know has been all over the headlines recently. Um, and I'll discuss how our responses to the pandemic has helped uh, bolster the US public health infrastructure uh, in a way that we can leverage uh, going forward. So let me start with a brief update on the state of the pandemic. And as you know, we've seen a concerning uptick in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, largely due to the Delta variant, which now represents more than 83% of infections in the United States. Our seven day average of daily new cases is about 37,000 cases per day. That's a 50% increase from the prior week. Hospitalizations are also up. It's about, about 3,500 um, cases uh, per day um, when it comes to admissions. And that's also an increase of over 30% from prior seven days. Um, we've also seen about 20% increase in reported deaths um, uh, from the seven day, um, the prior seven days to 237 deaths per day. Now, let me be clear, this is still a major improvement from the winter. Whereas today we're averaging over 37,000 cases, in January we were averaging nearly 200,000 cases per day. And we also expect to see proportionally lower upticks in hospitalizations and deaths, similar to what other countries with high level of vaccination, uh, like the UK and Israel are seeing the same issue with the Delta variant, but their hospitalizations are rising to a lesser degree when compared to their winter peaks. Uh, overall, in this country, we have more than 161 million people fully vaccinated, including over 80% of our seniors. We've made uh, remarkable progress, but we are seeing more counties with a high level of transmission risk today. Those regions that are experiencing the surges in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths that I just described, those are primarily in counties that have low vaccination rates. And why is that? Because we know that people who are fully vaccinated are protected against severe illness from this virus, including the Delta variant. But those who are unvaccinated remain at risk. And you know, this is truly becoming a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Um, in fact, unvaccinated individuals account for virtually all hospitalization and deaths in the United States. That's more than 97%. And I have to say that unvaccinated adolescents and adults, not only they're putting themselves at risk, we're also increasingly concerned about children under the age of 12 who are not yet eligible to get vaccinated and are relying on their parents, their older siblings, their teachers, their caregivers to stand between them and this virus. So we are the shields against the virus and we're not out of the woods yet. And it will continue to take intentional action to see cases come down and stay um, down. 
Now, let me turn to the significant progress we have all made in our fight against the virus. And as of today, more than 339 million doses of the vaccine have been administered. 68.6% of adults have had at least one dose. And more than 161 million people are fully vaccinated. We have more than 20, uh, we have 20 states and the District of Columbia and three territories, Puerto Rico, Guam, and Palau, that have reached the important milestone of 70% of adults with at least one shot. So this is significant progress, of course. And as you know, our work to vaccinate more people will have to continue. And this work is actually even more important today, given the spread of the Delta variant. And it continues to be essential given some of the racial and ethnic disparities in vaccination rates um, that we continue to see. Um, and a key challenge we are facing, um, uh, particularly in the African-American community, it composes 12% of the US population, but only have gotten 9% of the doses of the vaccine. For the Latinx community, the trend lines are improving. Um, the Latinx community composes 17% of the population and 16% of people with at least one shot. And when you look at the last two weeks, 30% of people who initiated vaccinations are Latinos. But we still have long ways to go in improving equitable outcomes. So in the weeks and months ahead, we will continue uh, mobilizing the whole of government to help end this pandemic by doubling down to get even more and more people vaccinated and stopping the spread as soon as possible when cases do uh, increase. Now, turning to the coming months, the focus to get more people vaccinated is going to be community by community, neighborhood by neighborhood, and person by person. We'll continue to partner with local leaders, governors, mayors, school administrators, doctors, employers, and community and faith leaders. And we have to continue to further integrate vaccinations into routine healthcare, including by getting more doses to primary care doctors and making more vaccinations available upon discharge from hospitals and emergency department. This will make it even easier for people to get vaccinated from healthcare providers they know and they trust. So in the last few months, we have nearly doubled the number of medical practices receiving the vaccine, and we have to continue to build on that, uh, on that progress. And we're going to put even bigger emphasis meeting people where they are to make getting vaccinated as easy and as, uh, as convenient, including by continuing to deploy mobile clinics to reach people in underserved uh, communities, leveraging our 40,000 federal pharmacy partners, getting more vaccines to pediatricians and other healthcare providers who serve younger people, while launching a comprehensive back-to-school campaign to get our nation's teens vaccinated ahead of the school year. And we're gonna continue to work with employers to get vaccination clinics at places of work, and we'll continue to place equity at the center of everything we do across all initiatives, working to remove barriers and increase access and confidence. So I'm gonna do a double click here on the primary care providers and health systems, um, uh, particularly as we know they're gonna continue to be essential to our vaccination efforts. And this is for a number of reasons. First, we know, and you all know, that PCP offices are a convenient place to get vaccinated with millions of unvaccinated people visiting them each month. We also know that PCP offices are the number one preferred place to get vaccinated, including amongst those who are less confident in the vaccine. And we know that primary care providers are the most trusted sources of COVID-19 vaccine information. Surveys have confirmed that by large margin again and again. So partnering with the CDC, we have been providing technical assistance to states to help them activate primary care providers and pediatrician as vaccinators and as vaccine ambassadors. And we are working with provider associations to help primary care providers and pediatricians enroll to vaccinate, set up their offices as vaccine clinics, and proactively reach out to their patients about getting vaccinated. Uh, we've also worked with several large associations on a number of vaccine-related commitments. And one example is the American Medical Group Association, which represents medical groups and health systems that provide care for a combined one-third of the country's population. 
AMGA reached out to its members to commit to take four actions, including proactively reaching out to their unvaccinated patients, partnering with community-based organizations on vaccine education and access, serving as a public vaccine ambassador on traditional and social media, and redoubling efforts to encourage healthcare colleagues to get the vaccine. And within a week of them sending their request, 162 of AMGA's medical group practices, representing 103,000 doctors who care for 64 million patients signed on to act. Another example is our work with the Alliance of Community Health Plans, which represents the nation's nonprofit health plans. They sent out a call to action to its member plans that serve a combined 24 million people in 36 states their members committed to a similar set of efforts as the AMGA. In addition, they committed to using data to identify the unvaccinated people in underserved rural and low-income communities and proactively reach out to them through social media, robocalls, emails, and text messaging, as well as supporting innovative vaccine delivery to reach those in rural um, communities or those who are homebound, as well as people who are unable to travel. And then the last example I'm gonna to give today is how we're seeing more and more hospitals commit to many of the hospital best practices, um, including vaccinations upon discharge from hospitals, vaccinations at emergency departments, distributing shots to hospitals affiliated primary care providers. And as a result of these efforts and, and of the collaboration across state, local governments, public health providers and health systems, we have seen an uptick in number of hospitals participating in this, and we've seen um, nearly doubled the number of medical practices receiving the vaccine. So we'll have to continue to build on that progress and continue to prioritize coordination and collaboration between public health and health systems. So thank you uh, for all your work on that, uh, on that front. Now, one other topic I wanted to touch on, and I'm looking forward to our Q&A session here, is about misinformation. This is truly one of the biggest obstacles standing between us and the end of this pandemic. Um, last week, Dr. Murthy, our Surgeon General, issued an advisory on the dangers of health information, which we define as false, inaccurate, or misleading information about health, according to the best evidence at the time. The Surgeon, General, uh, the Surgeon General reserves these advisories for urgent public health threats, and that is what health misinformation has become. Everyone in this country and in the world deserves to have honest, accurate information based on science and facts to be able to make decisions about their health and the health of their families. Yet today, many people don't have accurate information, and we are seeing that is leading to real harm to people's health. Health misinformation is not new, but it's the speed, the scale, and the sophistication with which it's spreading is new and disturbing. And because health information is everywhere, we need an all of society response to address it. So in the advisory, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to check it out. The Surgeon General included recommendations for everyone. And we start with individuals and families, asking them to raise the bar for sharing health information by checking to make sure that it's backed by credible scientific sources. And as we say in the advisories, if you're unsure, please don't share. We also included recommendations for seven other groups from health and education to research and journalism to philanthropy and government, and of course, technology companies. So this advisory encourages everyone um, to be cautious, be careful, and I advise you all to check it out. Now, I do want to spend a couple of minutes before we open it up for questions to, um, about the challenges, to talk about the challenges to the public health and public health infrastructure um, and how through the American Rescue Plan, we've made a number of large investments, both to address the COVID-19 pandemic and for the long term on helping to boost vaccine confidence for this pandemic. So you'll see we've invested $130 million in funding for trusted national and local organizations to support improved vaccine education efforts and to ensure communities have the information and tools they need to get vaccinated. Uh, nearly $250 million to help power jurisdictional vaccine confidence efforts 
uh, $100 million to fund vaccine outreach in rural health clinics. We actually just announced those uh, earlier today. And an additional $860 million for testing and mitigation measures at rural health clinics and rural hospitals. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with federally qualified health centers, we've delivered over $6 billion in funding to nearly 1,400 community health centers to expand access to vaccines, testing, and treatment to COVID-19, as well as help them address ongoing health uh, needs. And many of these dollars will be spent to help bolster community health center services in the long run. Um, community health workers, we've made significant investments of up to $250 million to hire community health workers who live in the communities they serve to increase vaccine access for the hardest hit and highest risk individuals and to prepare for future public health challenges. And the last thing I'm going to uh, touch on here is the public health workforce. We've invested more than $7 billion to hire and train public health workers in response to the pandemic. And this includes $4.4 billion to allow states and localities to expand their overstretched public health departments with additional staff um, and to support the development of the next generation of public health leaders by creating a public health uh, AmeriCorps and a $3 billion to create a new grant program that will facilitate federal investments in the people and expertise needed at the state and local levels to expand, train, and modernize our uh, public health workforce. We've also, I know this, this conference is about innovation. We've announced $1.7 billion investments to fight variants, including $1 billion to expand genomic sequencing through CDC partnerships with the laboratory communities and state laboratories. Uh, this funding will also support the collection of COVID-19 specimens, the sequences, sequencing of the viruses, and the sharing of the resultant uh, data. Um, there's also about $400 million to support innovation initiatives and cutting edge research into genomic epidemiology. Um, and this funding will be used to launch six new innovative centers of excellence in genomic epidemiology, which will operate as partnerships between state health departments and academic institutions. Partnerships could focus, for example, on developing new genomic surveillance tools. It also includes about $300 million to build and support a national bioinformatics infrastructure to create a unified system for sharing and analyzing sequence data in a way that protects privacy but still allows more informed decision uh, making. This funding also will support training to increase sequencing in clinical settings and expand CDC's bioinformatics fellowship uh, program. And then the last investments I want to note is on health equity. We've announced $2.25 billion over two years to address COVID-19 related health disparities and advance health equity amongst underserved populations, including racial and ethnic minority groups, as well as people living in rural uh, areas. Those dollars are gonna go to public health departments and uh, will improve testing, contact tracing capabilities, as well as developing innovative mitigation and prevention resources and services. will also improve data collection and reporting to advance health equity and address the social determinants of health. So that was a lot of information, and I want to I went through it really quickly so that will give us some more time um, to be able to have a Q&A. I want to leave you with a couple of closing thoughts here. The theme of this event is silver linings. The fact is this pandemic has caused enormous suffering, enormous heartache and death. And in that context, it's hard to see the silver linings but we need to make sure we learn the lessons that are right in front of our faces first. We need to end this pandemic as soon as possible. That's why we're continuing to go full speed on the vaccinations front, pushing on confidence, access, and equity initiatives, and activating primary care and health systems. This is also why we're sending surge response teams to states that are having outbreaks today. And it's why we're doing everything we can to combat misinformation. Second, we need to ensure that we are prepared and ready for any public health crises that could emerge in the future. That's why we have made such a large investment in the public health infrastructure. Um, so that's, uh, with that, I wanna thank you all for joining. We have a lot of work ahead of us and we will only be successful if we do it together. So I'm looking forward to the Q&A section.
Dr. Shukair, first, uh, thank you so much for for your thoughts and and for your work. Um, that was that was absolutely fantastic. We do have a, a few questions. I know we only have a couple minutes left, but um, can you talk a little bit? First question um, that came up in the chat. Can you talk a little bit about the vaccination strategy for um, the U.S. portion of the U.S. population that might have language barriers, um, developmental, or or other learning disabilities? So let me just start by saying that um, we are now at a point in our vaccination efforts where we have to be working on the ground level. It is truly about the ground game. It's about going community by community, um, city by city, block by block, and population by population. That's why it's important that we are partnering with community-based organizations that know these communities, like trusted people in those communities. And you'll see billions of dollars have gone to support these community-based organizations that know their communities that the community trust so that they can have these conversations, they can facilitate pop-up clinics, um, they can facilitate one-on-one um, -on -one conversations through our community core. It's those types of on-the-ground strategies that would make uh, that would make a big difference. Fantastic. Um, and then following up on that, um, we had a we had a speaker earlier that was doing some really innovative work in the in the fertility and the pregnancy space. Uh, another question that came through is. Um, can you talk a little bit about the strategy for uh, overcoming trepidation among uh, you know, preg pregnant or potentially pregnant uh, patients? Yeah, I have to tell you, I mean, this is one of the questions that I get the most. And I know this is when we ask people who are hesitant about the vaccine, that theme comes up regularly. Um, the, the fact remains is that um, there is no evidence whatsoever that the vaccines are causing infertility or they're unsafe in pregnancy. As a matter of fact, the CDC is tracking literally tens of thousands of women who've gotten the vaccine while they're pregnant, um, and there was no concerns that that um, um, that was picked up in that in that tracking process. So I think the ability to disseminate that information, be able to fight that misinformation, disinformation that's out there, is really important. CDC is putting messages out. We're talking to trusted messengers, providing them with the facts, with the data, so that they can have these conversations. And we're partnering with the American Academy of Family Physicians, American uh, College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, the American Academy of Pediatrics, so that their doctors are having these one-on-one -on -one conversations. Because at the end of the day, doctors are the most trusted messengers when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccine. And we'd want to make sure that people who have these questions are having the opportunity to talk to their doctors. Fantastic. Um, one more question that came through. Can, um, can you maybe highlight a few learnings that um, you and your team um, learned over, you know, over the past few months that are now being applied to um, fighting the Delta variant? Well, there are lots of learnings. I mean, we learn every day. We um, drive our strategies based on the science. That's why we have fantastic scientists at the CDC and the FDA and the NIH. And we're always adapting our strategies based on what the science tell us. Um, one key um, learnings that we've had through multiple surveys and focus groups is the importance of the conversations to be had between the patient, particularly people, particularly people who have questions about the vaccines with their doctors. So for the last many months, we've been working on an effort to make sure that doctors can have the vaccines in their offices. And we've seen that pay off. You know, you look at between early April and today, we've nearly doubled the practices, the number of medical practices that are offering the vaccines in their offices. So those are the types of learnings that we are um, 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 learning every single day, and we're adapting our strategies to respond to what we're learning. Perfect. And then, and then, final question for you: We have uh, we have a, a a wide variety and a large number of of innovators and entrepreneurs here on the call or on the Zoom, um, as well as a number of of health innovation hubs all around the country, scale health included. Um, I'm sure everyone is is hearing your remarks and thinking, you know, how can I get involved? How can I support? Um, any final thoughts, any calls to action for you know, the attendees that we have here today? Look, you know, the way I look at this is we are at a point where we have almost 69% of adults in this country with at least one dose. The other way to look at it 
there's still 31% of people, of adults, who haven't been starting their vaccination process. Any way we can think about how we innovate, about engaging those folks who haven't been vaccinated, figuring out a way to be able to get them um, to, to be more excited about getting vaccinated, I think will be really important. Understanding the nuances of the um, hesitancy there and how do you address that becomes really important. And as I've mentioned in the um, in some of the funding through the American Rescue Plan, there are lots of resources out there right now to support innovation in the healthcare space, um, um, innovation on genomic testing, innovation on therapeutics, innovation on um, a lot of other variety of things, biotechnology and others. So we'd encourage folks um, to get themselves familiar with these resources and see how they can plug in and support um, some of this work. Fantastic. Well, well, Dr. Shukar, thank you again so much for, for your time and, and your insights and, and all of your dedication to this, this big battle um, that we're all fighting. Well, thank you so much. And maybe if I have uh, one last call of a call to action for all of you and all of folks who are participating, um, if you haven't been vaccinated yet, please consider to do that. But I'm hoping the overwhelming majority of everybody here is vaccinated. So please take a moment if you've been vaccinated and help identify three or four or maybe five people you know who have not been vaccinated and please have that conversation with them. Share your experience, share your thoughts, I know people trust people they know. And if you can make a difference in three or four or five people, those are three or four or five people who become protected. And that would be really appreciated. So thank you so much for having me and um, have a great evening. Thank you. Well, that wraps it up, everybody.